So what were the issues at the inquest? First, the police denied throughout that Biko had been assaulted. Consequently, much of the police evidence was directed to finding some cause for his brain injuries which did not incriminate them. The second issue was the manner in which Steve Biko was treated throughout his detention. On the first issue, there was a story to which all the officers uh, ad adhered as best they could. On the morning of the 7th, was the, this was the evidence, Biko was taken from the mat on which he'd lain under, at night under guard and in shackles and was taken to the investigation room. There he was seated on a chair and when the major who was in charge of the investigation began to question him, he sprang up and attacked the major with such fury that it took a captain who was also present and three other officers to subdue him. In the course of this violent struggle, it was said, he must have bumped his head on the wall and fallen to the floor, but he was fighting furiously throughout and after he was brought under control, he was taken back to the mat where he was again placed in leg irons. And the police maintained that this bump, this head bump against the wall was the cause of all the brain injuries found post-mortem. Now before the inquest, affidavits had been sworn by every person who'd had any contact with Biko during his detention. But unfortunately for the police, none of these affidavits, and there were 28 of them, had made any mention of the alleged bump on the head. Nor it transpired had any of the three doctors who examined Biko when he was in detention ever been told of any bump on the head. The security police colonel in command of Port Elizabeth, whose name has been mentioned by Mr. Corsinati Biko this evening, but whom I shall not dignify by any name, he never mentioned this bump on the head to the doctors or in his affidavits. Further, the bump on the head version was utterly destroyed by the expert medical evidence. <clears throat> Professor Proctor, a world-renowned neuropathologist, as I've said, expressed the firm opinion that the brain injury suffered by Biko must have resulted in a period of unconsciousness of at least 10 to 20 minutes. The same view was expressed by Dr. Gluckman, and these pathologists were supported in their view by a pathologist called, not by us, but by the other advocates, Professor Simpson, who was head of the Department of Anatomical Pathology at the University of Pretoria. He agreed. The state pathologist, Professor Loebser, did not dispute this. Yet the evidence of all the officers was that Biko fought, as one of them put it, like a wild animal throughout. Their evidence under cross-examination eliminated even the shortest period of unconsciousness. So it was demonstrably untrue that that bump on the head in this alleged scuffle could have caused the brain injuries. Looking at these facts from what I hope is an objective distance, I have no doubt that between the evening of the 6th and the early morning of the 7th, Steve Biko suffered a number of heavy blows to the head inflicted by one or more of the security branch officers who were in charge of him, the assault was probably carried out with some instrument which left no obvious external injury, 
such as, and here I must admit I'm guessing, such as a sandbag or a loaded length of hose pipe. The latter object was known from later evidence to have been used on other occasions by the security branch in Port Elizabeth. That afternoon, on the 12th of September, Steve Biko died, lying on a mat in the Pretoria Prison Hospital. At the inquest, we described it without, I think, any undue rhetorical exaggeration as a miserable and lonely death. The evidence in the, uh, at the inquest came to an end and all counsel addressed the chief magistrate. The verdict came almost immediately on the morning after the inquest had ended and it contained no reasons. It took about three minutes to deliver. The chief magistrate found that Stephen Bantu Biko had suffered extensive brain injuries, probably sustained during a scuffle with police officers on the morning of the 7th September, and that the evidence did not prove that the death was brought about by any act involving or amounting to an offense on the part of any person. So once again, the verdict was nobody was to blame. Given the history of previous inquests, previous inquests into the deaths of detainees, the verdict, perverse as it was, was by no means a surprise to us, by that I mean to counsel in the case. To quote Ecclesiastes again, if thou seest the oppression of the poor, and the violent perverting of judgment and justice in a province, marvel not at the matter. But many did marvel. The verdict caused outrage in South Africa and well beyond. It flew in the face of all the evidence. Its formal result was to exonerate all the officers from the colonel downwards. They were not disciplined or even reprimanded for the manner in which they treated Biko after he'd suffered his injuries. On the contrary, the colonel was promoted to brigadier, and in due course so was the captain. In our closing address to the court, we said this, any verdict which can be seen as an exoneration of the Port Elizabeth security police will unfortunately be interpreted as a license to abuse helpless people with impunity. Unfortunately, we were right. Over the following 10 years, more than 30 people died while in detention by the security branch or having passed through their hands. <laughs>